online and one-on-one -on -one coaching. Mr. USA 2001, Quincy Taylor. Four times Mr. Olympia athlete. Show preparation and general fitness. 30 years of experience. Bring out your monster. MYTEQT1 at gmail.com at Quincy.monster. I'm Dave Palumbo, founder of Species Nutrition. From my earliest bodybuilding days, I believed in only putting the best in my body. And that lives on in the Species Nutrition line of products. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. Hey guys, we're super excited to be here at the LA Fit Expo. It's our third year in a row. And uh, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be launching a tasty pastry. It's a low carb pop tart. It's got three to four grams of net carbs. And we love this show. This is our best place to be in LA. Television on rxmuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, better known as hashtag Ask Dave, your 30 minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. All your questions, diet, training, supplementation, IFBB pros, news, whatever's on your mind, it is all on the tables. We now bring in Dave Palumbo. Dave, on today's episode of Muscle in the Morning, you set uh, at least our comment section, I'm sure there's going to be permutations around the bodybuilding world as well. Uh, a bit of a blaze with the comments, or at least the speculation, that Dexter Jackson, obviously we've seen him training, we've seen the footage of him training, um, and he told us very clearly at the end of last year's Olympia that he was done. He was not going to compete again. Don't ask him about classic physique or anything like that. He's done competing. But there is the specter of him competing when the Masters Olympia returns. <laughs> so I'll put you on the spot here. You want to go on record when the Masters Olympia, and I believe 2023, when it officially <laughs> returns, will we see Dexter Jackson in the lineup? You know, I would love to see him. And I know Dexter loves money. Like, that would be, that would be his main motivating factor, obviously, because he can win the money and the title. Um, but I, I, I think he's really done. I, you know, he, he gave 100% for such a long period of time. It wasn't like he took breaks and then came back. He went all out, and that's how Dexter is. You know, I think if he knew if he came back, he would not be as, as good as he was because it's really hard to get back when you're off that long to get that muscle back. And I, I don't think he would want to be anything less than his best on that stage. So I don't think he's going to do it. Plus, you know, there's a lot of guys over 40 now that, that – and I think they said they're going to do 45 and over. But there's guys over 45 that are really good, I mean, right now out there. Look at Kamala Gargney, who's 50, probably 51, right? I mean, he's awesome. Um, there's a lot of guys in that category who are still actively competing who are older. And I think that – I don't I – don't, I, I think Dexter had enough, you know. The, Milo said it best once. He said he had done like 100 shows in a row or something like that. He competed like for two years straight with never missing a show. And he said he wanted to take a break. So he took like a six-month break. He said he could never get back in that in that – that rhythm again it just it just wasn't the same it was like once he stopped it, it he it killed his momentum and i understand what he's talking about it's like when you're in the rhythm of doing it all the time and it's just it seems like it's flowing easily and then you stop and then all of a sudden it's like oh my god it's so hard to get back to that point where you were at your peak and so i don't think dexter has any interest in doing it although i'm sure he'll be there and he'll be commenting and He'll probably find it interesting. Look, he won everything there is to win, so there's not he has nothing to prove at this point. You know, like I said, it would just be a money thing for him. And I think if he doesn't think he knows he's not going to be at his best, you know, so I don't think he would ever step on that stage. 
but it will be fun to speculate over the course of the next 18 months. Yeah. Let's go to the questions. The first two questions, of course, from the Dave Palumbo experience after the first question, uh, Proviron or Arimidex for women and why? You know, it's been great. You know, the Dave Palumbo Experience app, which is um, a uh, an app you download, it's twenty nine dollars a month. You kind of get me as your coach in your pocket. It's all my writings, all my videos ever done. We put up a workout every week. I answer everyone's questions in an open forum there, so everyone sees everyone's questions, everyone sees everyone's answers, and also. I do a Q&A video, like this Q&A we do every week here, the Ask Dave, I do that exclusively for the app. So a lot of people have been signing up lately. They really have been thanking me for, for the great information we're putting there. So if you guys want to continue to learn more about this type of stuff, it's a, it's a great value. You can sign up at your iTunes store or your Android store. You know, as far as women are concerned, women produce their, assuming we're talking about women that are premenopausal, meaning women who still get their periods or women who are young who still can potentially get their periods because some women don't get it because they're on anabolics. But um, assuming you're getting your period, Arimidex is really not the drug to block estrogen in your body because women's estrogen is produced from their ovaries. It's not produced by aromatization from testosterone. Men take Arimidex or Femara or Aromacin because we convert testosterone into estrogen, and that's where the estrogen comes from. You can't stop the production of estrogen in women's bodies, but you can block the receptors for them. And that's why most women, you know, or at least the women that are smart and the women at least that I advise, they use Nulvidex because Tamoxifen or Nulvidex blocks estrogen receptors. So even though we, there is estrogen in their bodies, we block the receptors so that the estrogen can't get there and do, you know, cause fluid retention and all those other things. It does, uh, you know, fat deposition in the lower body. And that works very effectively. Matter of fact, it's so effective that, you know, for women with breast cancer that is estrogen dependent, they give them tamoxifen. Because, and and it, a lot of times it puts them right into remission. That's how effective that drug is at 10 milligrams twice a day. Um, Proviron, you know, when, when I was first learning about anabolics from Bill Phillips back in the 90s when he wrote his anabolic reference guide, everyone thought, well, at least Bill thought, that Proviron blocked estrogen receptors. And it really... We, we have since found out that it doesn't do that. Um, so it's, et, Proviron would not be a good estrogen inhibitor in that matter. Um, supposedly, it displaces testosterone from the uh, sex hormone binding globulins, making more testosterone free and available. I'm not so, I'm not so sold on that. I, I, don't, I don't really like Proviron. I really don't use it that much. To me, I think it kind of in, it, it competes with other drugs for androgen receptors. And because of that, it might make them less anabolic. Because remember... You want the most anabolic drugs binding to your androgen receptors. Proviron has no anabolic properties to it. It's, it's purely androgenic in the sense that it just kind of has androgenic effects in the body. So I'm not really a big fan of, of Proviron. For women, Nulvidex is the way to go. Now, if a woman is postmenopausal, she's not producing, um, getting a period anymore, you know, that cycle has stopped in her. Any estrogen in her body, which would probably be very low, a lot of women have to go on estrogen replacement because they have such low estrogen. But if they did have some estrogen production via aromatization from adrenal androgens, the adrenal glands producing, you know, uh, DHEA, which can convert to testosterone, that would be a valid use of Arimidex. But like I said, most women just don't produce enough. So there's really no in need to inhibit it. Now, there are some women that are crazy enough to take testosterone and drugs that do aromatize, which is ridiculous because they're going to get a massive side effects from that. In those cases, taking Arimidex might be warranted because they are taking drugs that aromatize. But, you know, for most women, they don't fit into that category. Most women are not, you know, running a, a testosterone cycle at five, 600 milligrams a week. There are some out there, but most aren't. Second question again from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Uh, Dave, do I need to use Caber when I use Trend? I've had prior issues with prolactin. I don't see the use of Caber in any of your protocols uh, in the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Mm -hmm. um, Carbergaline, also known as Dostinex, which is the brand name of it, um, blocks prolactin or lowers prolactin levels in the body, which is warranted if you're taking drugs that raise prolactin. Now, DECA and, and Trenbolone potentially can raise prolactin. It's really a dose-dependent thing, and it's very genetic, too. Like, I know guys that could take 50 milligrams a week of DECA, and, and, they, and they, they can't perform. They can't get erections because their prolactin levels go through the roof. I know other guys who could take four or 500 milligrams of DECA a week, and their prolactin levels don't increase, and they have no problem with, with sex drive. So it's really, you kind of got to go on the symptoms. If I was one of these people, you know, that was very sensitive to DECA, I probably just wouldn't take it. 
you know, rather than having to take another drug to try to counteract it. If uh, Trenbolone usually is not as bad as DECA, but then again, when you start raising the dose of Trenbolone above what you really should, I mean, because theoretically, 50 milligrams of Tren um, acetate three times a week is more than enough, but guys do like 1,000 milligrams sometimes I hear nowadays, which I think is crazy because it really jacks your blood pressure up and, and your digestive system gets all kind of messed up from it. Some people get hiccups from it, but in those cases, when you raise the, the Trenbolone dosage, that high prolactin really does go up a lot. Now, the, the best way to know what's going on is obviously to go for blood work and check your prolactin levels. You know, if they're high, then, you know, you can use cabergoline at a half a milligram, you know, three times a week, maybe more if you need it. Um, it's, it's one of these things that doesn't need to be taken every single day. Uh, once again, it's a dose-dependent thing. Um, so I kind of tell people it's not... Back in, you know, when you go on 1,000 milligrams of testosterone a week, usually it's a good idea to start an aromatase inhibitor with it because we know the testosterone is going to aromatize. With Decker and Trembolone, we're not really sure how much prolactin is going to go up. So it's not a knee-jerk, okay, put cabergoline in there every single time. Um, because these, these drugs have side effects too. There's other side effects that go along with that. So test your levels. If they are high and you are experiencing prolactin side effects, you know, discharge from the nipple or, or erection issues, then address it. Then you could either, if you have one or two choices, go off the drug or take some, you know, cabergoline. Let's go to our Instagram question. I'll leave before we do that, um, I did want to make somewhat of an announcement. So, you know, uh, obviously you see Lee Priest on this channel and you know now that Lee Priest is part of the species nutrition family. Uh, we're going to be launching something. So we're still ironing out the details, but I did want to kind of put this out on your radars. Uh, something to look out for. Uh, we're going to be doing some exclusive content on the Species Nutrition Instagram page. So if you're not already following us on Species Nutrition on Instagram, it's simply Species Nutrition, all one word. Uh, we're going to be doing some exclusive content, some exclusive Q and A's. Um, you know, some exclusive thoughts from Lee Priest. You know, whatever it is. And obviously, you know Lee. And you know when we when we signed Lee, one thing we wanted to make it very clear to Lee is that we didn't want to just kind of bottle them up as just a bodybuilder and just talk bodybuilding, just talk about your species intake. We wanted him to be Lee Priest, right? We wanted him to be real raw, you know, about whatever it is, right? So now obviously he's on Iron Rage. Iron Rage, you know, you know, was really made as, all right, it's an, it's an outlet for, for Dave, you know, Lee Priest, John Romano, to sort of vent their frustrations on a lot of things. So but what we're going to do now, and again, this is going to be exclusively on the Species Nutrition uh, Instagram page. We're going to be doing a little bit more of a focused Q&A with Lee Priest. These are going to be questions just like we do here on Ask Dave. Um, they're going to involve user interaction, so you're going to be able to ask your questions to Lee. And then, you know, we're going to get Lee's temperature on whatever is going on, newsworthy <laughs> topics in bodybuilding, maybe outside of bodybuilding. But, you know, it's going to be a little bit more of a focused Q&A for Lee. So, again, if you haven't already... If you're not already following us on Instagram for Species Nutrition, it's all one word, Species Nutrition. That's going to be launching over the course of the next two weeks. Um, again, if you're not already subscribed to our YouTube channel, subscribe below, hit the notification bell. If you like what you're watching this show or any of our shows throughout the course of the week, hit the like button, comment below. And as always, we appreciate all of your support. Let's go to Jersey Kid. Um, Dave, I read this study uh, suggests a link between ARB uh, angiotensis receptor blockers for high blood pressure leading to an increased risk of cancer long-term. Do you buy your opinion? You know, I've actually seen that study. So one of my clients sent it to me, actually, Tony Bruno. And, um, you know, there's the, the two best ways that we have right now of, of lowering blood pressure with the least side effects would be ACE inhibitors, like Ramipril, Lisinopril, and I've been advocating those for years. I've been taking Ramipril for over 25 years, and it really controls my blood pressure well. I have zero side effects from it. Um, it's very kidney protective because it opens the kidney tubules up a little so they get to filter blood better. Um, it, it's, a, it's a really well-documented you know, um, drug because it's been around so long. And then the new, the new kids on the block are the angiotensin receptor blockers. So it's kind of like a Remedex versus Nolvidex. In other words, the receptor blockers just block the receptors uh, for angiotensin um, enzyme, converting enzyme. And they're new. Those are like Valsartan, Telemisartan. I know a lot of people have been, you know, going off like thinking Telemisartan is going to build muscle and something like that. But it really, it really doesn't. But whatever. I mean, it, it does lower blood pressure and, and people, the thought processes has been that, oh, this might be a, a, a better way to do it. 
And, you know, I've talked to my cardiologist before about it. He's a bodybuilder too. And he, he, his big thing always was that, you know, there's not that much long-term data on these new angiotensin receptor blockers. It's not that they don't, you know, it's, it's just not there, the data, because they haven't been around that long. So he always told me just, you know what, you have good results. You, your blood pressure is well controlled. You're really good. No side effects on the ACE inhibitors. Stay on those. He's on them too, the ACE inhibitors, because he likes the fact that they've been around so long. Now this new study comes out. And, and once again, the study was a retrospective study looking at people who've been on these angiotensin receptor blockers for, you know, extensive period of time. And they found that there's a, there's a correlated higher risk of cancer in long-term use of these. So not like if you're using it for like two, three weeks. I'm, people who've been on it years and years and years seem to have a higher incidence of all cancers. Now, the one thing that they didn't really look at, okay, was they didn't like flesh out was the fact that are these people smoking? What kind of a diet they were following? But... There was, it was a very big sample size, meaning there was a lot. I think there was over 100,000 people they looked at, it, I believe. Um, don't quote me on that number. Um, and because of that, it seems like the data could, is, is probably, you know, because not everyone was smoking there. Not everyone is eating bad. So it seems pretty like there is a pattern here, you know, to people getting cancer who are on these drugs long term. So that's a little, that's a little you know, troubling, you know, if, if, Someone and I, when people ask me what what you know blood pressure meds, I always send them to tell them ramipril or lisinopril. That that's just my go-to because I feel comfortable with that. I know it works for me. Um, and when they ask me about these other ones, I always say, well, if it works for you, then that's fine. But you know what? This data is a little scary, so you might want to consider you know using an ACE inhibitor rather than a angiotensin receptor blocker. Obviously, there's going to be more studies and more. They're going to look into this much further, and we'll know down the road. But you know, in the meantime, if the ACE inhibitor works just as good, you know, that might be a better option. So you might want to consider that. Let's go to Kylie Heffernan. I'm four weeks out from doing my first ever NPC show. Uh, my coach will not be going. So making the trip by themselves. Any tips on what to do and to look for backstage pump, eating, physique in itself? Uh, I'm competing in figure. Yeah. You know, the, the best thing I think I can, the best advice I can give you backstage is don't do crazy stuff and don't watch what anyone else is doing. Because when I remember when I first was backstage for the very first show, I did, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, you watch everyone, some of these guys are like pumping up for like two hours. Don't even pump up, just move around, do your routine. You know, if you're in figure, do your walkouts, you know, get it, break a little bit of a sweat just to get you know, you know blood going. But if you do too much, remember you're, you know, you're, you're carved up. You know, you're looking your best. You don't want to do a workout back there because you're going to then exhaust and deplete glycogen, which is going to flatten you out. It could drop your blood pressure. Excuse me, it could drop your blood sugar on stage because you're using up too many carbs backstage because you're nervous and you're overdoing things. Sit and relax. When they tell you to get up and you got 20 minutes to go out there, you get up, you, you warm up, you get your oil on. You know, the best thing I can tell you is relax and enjoy. There's not much you can do backstage that's going to change how you look at that point. Um, if you have to start playing games backstage, then then you probably didn't do the, you do your homework, you know. So the less you do, the better, you know. Make sure you go to the bathroom before you walk out on stage, so you don't have to, you know, you don't have that uncomfortable feeling. You can pull your stomach in, but don't watch what a million other people do because people do the stu I've seen people do the dumbest stuff backstage, from drinking alcohol and then getting drunk on stage, eating sugars, and then their blood sugar drops on stage and they start sweating profusely. Don't do kooky stuff. If you have a coach, he's going to give you a game plan to go there with. Follow the game plan. If something doesn't seem like it's going wrong, if you're cramping or something like that, contact your coach. You know, text him. Say, hey, I feel like this. What, what should I do? Don't start asking people backstage because they're going to give you a thousand different you know responses. Probably 999 of them you shouldn't listen to. <laughs> so don't do crazy stuff. Stick to the game plan. I have to ask only because I'm sure there are people probably listening right now who just caught you talking about competitors drinking alcohol backstage. Yeah. Now, myself, someone who's never competed, <laughs> so we'll probably will never compete. Yeah. Uh, is that a thing? Yeah. Some people like to drink wine backstage. I've seen people with, with like hard alcohol backstage. I don't know if they think it gives – people think it gives you veins. The judges don't care about veins. They care about conditioning. So. I think for most people that do it, it's probably more of a relaxation thing. But I've seen people That's get. Awesome. But you've yeah. got to remember, you're dehydrated, okay, severely, and you're not really eating a ton of food back there. You start drinking alcohol in a dehydrated state like that, it hits you fast, and and you can go down for the count. I mean, it will amplify itself ten times. You think you could have one glass of you know 
wine, normally it'll feel like you had 10 glasses of wine. So don't start messing around. The worst, if you don't drink alcohol every day before you go to the gym, then don't drink it backstage before you go on stage. You don't do things that you don't do normally because otherwise you have effects that you have not anticipated and then things go wrong. I had a girl who was on a, this girl used to cheat on her diet and I just barely got her into the show. She was perfect. I said, but she was like at that point where if I fed her any carbs, she was going to basically, you know, just smooth out. She had super great genetics. She didn't need anything. She was perfect. She was going to win. She would have won the team universe, this girl. And backstage, she decided she was going to eat fruit. I don't even know where she got the fruit from. If someone gave it to her or she snuck it in there and she's on stage, everyone, she's got her right in the middle. She's going to win the show. And she passes out or just starts like, Way, you know, wobbling and she's going to go down and then they take her off stage and she passes out backstage. What happened? She ate fruit, simple sugars. She was nervous. Her, her blood sugar plummeted now because her brain wasn't in ketosis anymore and it was looking for more sugar and she just had a low blood sugar spell, which she never would have had it happened if she had not had that. Um, if she would have just stuck to the peanut butter I was giving her backstage, you know, that would have been fine. But, but people do, don't do stuff that you're not supposed to do. You know, stick to what your coach tells you. I just want to hear from someone that actually got hammered before going out. Lavroni, Lavroni used to always drink alcohol before going out there. That was his. his I thought thing. that was more a function of like the night before. No, no, I think he did it. I think he did it before he went on stage too. <laughs> but you know what? If you do that all the time and that's your that's part of your game plan and you've tested it before, then that's a different story. But don't just because you see someone else back there and they say, "Oh, uh, what is that for?" and they're like, "Oh, it brings out your veins." Hey, you want to try some? <laughs> yeah, don't don't try it if you don't do that regularly. You know. Some of the good stuff. Uh, mature muscle. I, ha I eat a high-protein diet, eggs, chicken, so on and so forth. Do you think there's enough amino acids in that food, or should I take a supplement with essential amino acids, uh, specifically to use the protein that I intake more efficiently? <laughs> you know, I, I, I love this question because, you know, people think that amino acids are something special and beyond what's in the food. And I, I always like to give throw the statistic at people. One scoop of whey isolate contains 11,000 milligrams of amino of, of branch chain amino acids, not just of amino acids, obviously it's, it's 30,000 milligrams of, of amino acids, but 11,000 milligrams of branch chain amino acids for one scoop of whey isolate. And that's 11 grams, okay? That's more than any branch chain amino acid, you know, formula would ever, you know, give you in one serving. And that's only one scoop. A lot of guys do what, two scoops, you know, they, they might do 60 grams of whey isolate. That's going to give you, you know, 20, over 20,000 milligrams of branch chain amino acids. How you could possibly think that throwing some more amino acids in there is going to make any difference or make it any better is ridiculous, you know? So um, that's just, that's because people don't really understand that branch chain amino acids are integral in the food you're eating already. You know, they're already in there. Um, your body, as your body digests them, they're going to have copious amounts of them. And if you're using a whey isolate shake, that stuff gets digested in minutes. So it's going to be right in your bloodstream. So no, you don't need extra aminos. And that's also why if you're on a diet where you're eating six meals, six meals slash shakes a day, and then you start pounding amino acids all day long, it's going to block you know fat loss in your body because your body's going to use these branch chain aminos and turn them into glucose, use it as fuel. You don't want your body using the aminos as fuel. You want your body to use stored body fat as fuel and the, the, the food you're eating as fuel. So there's no free calories. You can't just arbitrarily take extra you know, calories in, Whether even though on the branched-chain amino acid bottle it says zero calories. It's not zero calories. If you have eight grams of branched-chain amino acids or, or essential amino acids, that's eight grams of protein. Each gram of protein has four calories. So that's, you know, you're, still, you're getting calories that your body can use as energy and fuel. So nothing's free. I know you love the cross-generational comparisons, so we'll ask this one. Todd Payette Universe, Bob Harris, Barry DeMay, Samir Banut can compete today at the respective all-time best. How do you think they would do at the Olympia today, but in the classic physique division? You know, I don't know if Samir could make the classic physique um, cutoff, to be honest with you. He had, he had a lot more, you know, he wasn't that tall. He had a lot more muscle than, you know, people think. Um, if he can make it, I think he, he might be Mr. Olympia, you know, but he looks, he's pretty big. I, I think he was too heavy, maybe. Um, you know, same thing Bob Paris. Bob Paris had a lot of muscle, too. I mean, if you could put these guys in there without, you know, having a problem with them making weight, I think they would, both, all of them would do very good. I think that Samir would probably do the best. I mean, he was Mr. Olympia in the open division, for God's sake. So, 
you know, if he came in at his best, he would certainly be first or second, you know, in the classic physique Olympia today, which is, which would be a real feather in his cap because, you know, most guys from the past, you know, they just couldn't, you know, keep up with the guys today. So uh, I would say Samir would probably be the guy that I'd like to see the most. Uh, Sean Sherman, test the last question. Great product. I've been seeing great results in terms of noticeable test increase, prostate doing better, hair getting better. Uh, once I finish the one month cycle, can I keep taking it or do I need to wait a month? Also, can I keep taking arthrolyze along with it? Yeah, the nutritional supplements can be taken indefinitely. There's nothing in, in testolize. It's not it's not a hormonal product. It tweaks the hormonal makeup of your body naturally. So you can you definitely want to stay on that. So if if you have high DHT levels or and or high estrogen levels and you're taking testolize and it's and it's fixing those levels by lowering DHT, your hair's getting thicker, you're not breaking out as much, which a lot of people use it for that reason. Chris Aceto is He's like, that's the greatest hair product I've ever used. You know, his hair got, and he's got a good head of hair. He was convinced he was losing it and uh, he started taking it and helped. And that's typical. Men, as we get older, we, our DHT levels go up because we convert more testosterone into DHT, more testosterone into estrogen. So you could absolutely use that. Likewise, young kids, girls and boys in their teens have very high DHT levels. And so a lot of times that can cause acne problems and, and, and those people, and it works really well. But yeah, you'd want to stay on it because... You want to keep tweaking your levels to keep the DHT lower, the estrogen a little lower, and the testosterone higher. And so that's what it's doing. It's balancing all those hormones. Arthrolyze is basically, I always tell, I always tell people, arthrolyze is basically a pro- protein powder for your joints. You know, So you need about four grams of glucosamine and about four grams of MSM per day to really give your body the raw materials that it needs to repair joint and connective tissue, create the synovial fluid that's the lubrication of the joints. So you if you're working out hard and you're taking in enough protein and vitamins and minerals, you'd be crazy not to take, you know, enough glucosamine and MSM. That's why Arthrolyze works so well in conjunction because as you're wearing and breaking down joint and connective tissue, you're repairing it because you're giving your body the raw materials. You don't want to get to the point where you've completely worn away your, your joint, your, your cartilage and your joints uh, or the tendons and, and ligaments have gotten weak because you're never giving your body the raw materials to strengthen them. And then all of a sudden you start tearing things or you have arthritis and you're like, I don't know, what should I do? Now you're pl- trying to play catch up. Once the damage is done to that severity, it's hard to reverse it. Um, so I recommend if you, t- just like you take your protein in every day, you take your joint support as well. And once again, the dosage is super important. You need at least four grams of these ingredients per day. So stay on that. Absolutely. Um, we had one question from uh, Mohsen Shand about how many years you could stay on TRT. And then uh, there's another question about TRT, you specifically. Um, you mentioned you were on a TRT treatment for 10 years and then came off it. How did you restart your natural tea production and while on TRT treatments? Um, and what happened to the uh, per- perturity gland? How, does it Pituitary. just shut down? Pituitary gland. Yeah, that's just spelled it completely. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, I probably would have stayed on HRT for the rest of my life, you know, <laughs> if I wasn't going to have kids. You know, I was I was on ten years. I was not, I had no intention of coming off of it. And then when I had my children or wanted to have children, I I did my I created that pregnancy baby making protocol, and um, I did the HMG, the HCG, the Clomid. Down the road, I started using glutathione too, and obviously my my B mineralize, since a good multi mineral multivitamin is important for sperm health. Once I got my wife pregnant the first time, I knew we wanted another one. So I just stayed on, on the HCG and HMG. You know, uh, once well, I went off them for a little, I went off the, I stayed on the HCG, I went off the HMG, and then I restarted again when we started trying to have the next one. And so that was like a two, three year process that I was off gear. So being on HCG that much every other day for, you know, two, three years straight, my levels just kicked on, I guess, at some point. Because when I, after the second kid, I stopped everything and I went and got blood work. And my levels were still pretty good of my testosterone. It was like 450 to 500. And I, fe- and I felt good. You know, it, I said this before on, on different shows. You could have a testosterone level, a total testosterone of 800, and you might feel terrible, okay? Because you just don't have good androgen receptors. And then there's other people who have a testosterone level of 300, and they feel great. They have a good sex drive. They recover well. Everything seems good because they have good androgen receptors. So... I must have pretty good androgen receptors because my levels are not super high, but I feel good at like 500, 450 around there. Um, that's fine for me. Um, when we had my third baby, which was an accident in a sense, because we really weren't trying, 
which um, I was on. The only thing I was on was glutathione. And that's when I discovered that glutathione injectable can increase the motility, how well the sp sp sperms swim. Uh, and that's probably how I got her pregnant then. But obviously, I was still producing sperm at that point. But I, w I was taking sporadic HCG shots just because I like the way I feel in them. The reason I never went back on HRT was because I felt good. I'm like, I don't, I, I feel great. Why am I, why go on a, an exogenous hormone when I don't need it? So every, so I, you know, every couple of weeks I take a couple, a shot of HCG here and there just for good measure. But um, that's just me. Some guys don't. If I didn't get turned back on, or if I felt terrible, low energy, no sex drive, I absolutely would go back on HRT. Now I'm not against it. I'm completely in favor of it. I just don't think not everyone needs it. That's all. If you if you need it, you do it. If you don't. Don't worry about it. If you do need it, stay on it. There's no reason to go off of it. As long as you're not abusing it and going high, high dosages, then you're going to, and your health markers are good on blood work, then you have nothing to worry about. Um, the good thing about being on just an HCG shot once in a while is I never have to work my blood, my hemoglobin and hematocrit is never high. All my blood work is pretty normal. So that's another reason why I just say, you know what? Why should I mess with anything? Everything looks good. Take two, three more questions. Uh, Justin Frank, do you recommend pulling out long acting esters a couple of weeks before a show so as to negate any water retention? Or do you think a diuretic is enough to do the job? Yeah, you know, long acting, short acting esters, what's the difference? I mean, if you're taking test propionate every day instead of doing a testosterone and anthate shot three times a week, What's the difference? You're still putting testosterone in your body. You're not going to hold any more or less water with it, okay? When you dry out at the end, and, and I have guys that could be, I know guys that take a lot of gear, and they're dry as a bone that week before the show, and then they start carving up, and, you know, the last day you take your diuretic, you restrict your water, and you, then you come on stage dry. I've never seen a person not be able to get dry because of the drugs that they were taking. Now, if you're taking 18 IUs of GH, that can cause excessive water retention, but no one does that before, right before a show. You know, most people will either stop it or they'll cut back to two, three IUs a day, and that doesn't really cause excessive fluid retention. And once again, any retention that's there is going to be peed out with the diuretic and with the fluid and with the fact that you're not going to be drinking probably 12 hours, you know, before getting on stage. So now I, I, I keep I use long acting esters with my guys right up to the week of the show because it doesn't matter. Testosterone is testosterone. It's going to have the same effect on the body. And you know what? The great thing about cypionate and anthate is it doesn't leave big welts on, the, on, on wherever you're injecting it. If you go to test propionate or test suspension thinking, oh, these are short-acting uh, testosterone esters. I'm going to hold less water. You're going to have big red welts everywhere you shoot this thing because that's what those things, those esters do. They're just irritate, they irritate the tissues you put them into. So my suggestion is to stay on long-acting esters. Uh, Big Ant, Dave, the people who eat a muffin or Pop-Tarts right before they weight train, is it more placebo? Does it take more time to, for the food to digest and use the energy correctly? Who knows? You know, uh, <laughs> my friend Dave Watson used to love eating Pop-Tarts before going to the gym. So whenever I would train with him two times a week or so, I would drive out to Deer Park Gold's gym back in the day. We would have pop tarts. On. I didn't even wasn't even a pop tart eater, but I was in his house, and that's what he ate. So I ate a pop tart too. It's basically pure sugar. I mean, so if anything, we just we just probably used it as fuel, you know, before we went to the gym. But I always sipped a, you know, like a, a some kind of a protein shake too. Not a protein, not like a whey shake. I would always sip one of those like perfect, you know, whatever. I don't know what they, I don't even remember what they used to have these. American bodybuilding protein shakes I would sip, which actually gave me a stomach ache most of the time. I, I Once I got later into my career and I started using like coconut water or Gatorade, I always felt better on those. Um, you know, probably nowadays I would use an amino acid. Uh, I would probably use like Amino Evolved or something like that. I have a lot of my clients who do that while they're training. They're sipping that. The great thing about the aminos is that you also have the electrolytes in there. So and they don't need to be digested because they're already in free form. So that's probably what I would do today. If you saw my workouts today, they're so fast that I don't need, I don't need to drink anything. I, I, I swig down an amino evolved in the car. I go into the gym. Sometimes I even eat a protein bar. I go into the gym. I train. I'm out in 45 minutes and, and you know, I'm doing a post-workout meal or something like that. So, you know, it depends what, what level you're at. But, I, I, you know, if you like a Pop-Tart and you're off-season, eat a Pop-Tart. Daniel Donabat, um, best protein sources before bed. You know, I like, you know, everyone always, you know, talks about like casein protein, which is a longer, takes longer to digest because it kind of has a congealing effect in, inside the body. Um, you know, I use casein protein in my pudding product, my protolyzed pudding product, which 
If you guys have not tried, it's probably it's probably if you like pudding and the, the consistency of pudding, it's unbelievable. It's a really it's a sleeper product that a lot of guys don't know about. But we have like our cult following, the people who know about it, and they just order it, you know, every single month. Uh, we have vanilla and chocolate. I personally like the vanilla the better, but they're both really good. And you can mix them in two ounces of water and have instant pudding. We use casein in there because it, it helps thicken it up without me having to add carbs to it. So there's no carbs added to it, and so we get a thicker uh, type of thing. You could actually use the, the protolized pudding to even make a thicker protein shake if you like a thick shake. Um, but I don't think that casein adds any benefit in terms of like um, delaying absorption like before bed. But we call it a time-release protein because it does take longer to absorb. So if you like to use a protolized shake before bed, yeah, it's going to definitely slow the digestion process. What I like to do is, is add a fatty acid source to weigh isolate before bed. And, and the great thing about protolyze too, it's only nine, it's 90% isolate. It's only 10% casein. Um, but if you're going to do just a pure casein shake thinking, oh, I'm going to, this is going to be a better shake to do before bed because it takes longer to digest. I think you're cheating yourself because whey isolate is, is such a superior source of protein. I would rather see you do something like a protolyze or something that has a little bit of casein maybe with mostly whey isolate and then add like a tablespoon of all natural peanut butter like Smuckers or something like that or put a tablespoon of macadamia nut oil in there and then drink that before bed because we all know that protein well maybe we don't all know but I'm just telling you protein and fat okay in a low carb environment okay which is what we were trying to create before bed will cause a much greater growth hormone release while you're sleeping Carbs seem to suppress natural growth hormone at night. So you don't really want to eat a huge carb meal. Unless you're one of these people like, the, like myself back in the day that had such a crazy fast metabolism that I was jamming in carbs anywhere I can get it. Okay, And I didn't care because I was taking exogenous GH anyway. But if you want to create the perfect hormonal environment you know, during the nighttime, take a high protein, moderate fat you know, type of shake in before bed um, and go to sleep and you're going to get... The maximum GH response as you're about 90 minutes into into sleep, that's when your body right, releases its own GH. And if in the if the carb or glucose levels are low in the bloodstream, you're going to get a much greater GH release. Take a couple more questions. Uh, Paul Fallible, your favorite shoulder press variation for building massive delts and why? Uh, barbell, dumbbell, Smith machine. Yeah, I mean, I, I was, I'm a big believer in free weights for, for mass. And it's funny, since I've had my shoulders you know, replaced, I, I do all free weight movements. People are like, how come you don't do machines? I'm like, I'm so happy I could do free weights again. I just always love the feel of, of free weights. I mean, I, went to, I did shoulders today. I went into the gym. I did dumbbell press, seated dumbbell presses. I was w working up to the 45s, which for me is a lot. You know, um, I'm on no gear. You know, I got two, you know fake shoulders in there. It feels great. doesn't hurt. It, it's like, I feel like my old self. I'm like, holy mackerel, this feels great that I'm pushing it up. And you can feel the difference because it's, I'm stabilizing these dumbbells as I'm pressing them up. And I got to keep them, you know, from going side to side. There has to be more development. If I get on a Smith machine and do it and just push against that bar, the machine is doing all the stabilization for me in the world. Same thing with the, if any kind of machine you're using. It's just the machine stabilizes the weight for you. So if I'm looking to increase mass, I'm going to do barbell presses. Either, probably in front, I used to do them behind the neck. Probably I do them in front, of the, in front now just because I think it's less traumatic to the shoulder. Or, and or probably you should pick one pressing movement, either you know barbell presses or... And, or dumbbell presses then go to your lateral movements now i like to do um the side lateral machine where you put that kind of pad on your arm and you like lift up because i think it's very isolating for the side delt um, i like to do a cable either in this position or in this position for fronts and then if you guys have seen my video where i use that side lateral machine i get my elbow behind it and i kind of go sideways and i do rear delts that way um, I, I those are my movements that i do i do about three sets for each head the fronts the sides and the rears and then I'll do some kind of a shrug movement. In the gym, I have this a shrug machine, actually, that I, I like to use. Um, but you can use dumbbells, let them hang in front of you and just shrug up. You can use barbell. There's sometimes we have that, that, that bar where you can grip it on the side. That works really well. And that can be varied around. And that's my, that's my shoulder workout. So the more free weight you can do on that, I think the better. I like cables for the, you know, or the machine for the side stuff because that's an isolating movement. But when you're doing the compound movements, if you can do free weights, do your free weights. Last question from Trip Beats. Who had the better physique? The Rock or Hulk Hogan? 
I think The Rock had a, a better. The Rock definitely has a better quality physique. He, he's much more ripped. Hogan was never super shredded. He just had those big monster arms that he he kind of like you know uh, marketed. And you know, but back in the day, there wasn't a lot of ripped you know wrestlers. So Hogan looked great because he was huge. He, you could tell the guy worked out. He had a lot of muscle. He was never really shredded. He always had you know some body fat on him. But he had the whole persona. The Rock without a doubt in a bodybuilding contest would destroy you know Hulk Hogan he just has better quality but there's also more there's more knowledge today there's more about nutrition and diet and you know people I, I don't think those weight train I don't think those wrestlers trained as much with weights although Hogan probably did back in the day but I don't think they I don't think they were as concerned with diet you know and stuff like that they kind of ate what they wanted they were on the road a lot you know they weren't they weren't being paid what they are today so I think they were probably eating a lot of fast food and stuff like that so uh I think The Rock has a better physique, you know, if I had to like judge it that way. But I loved Hogan and I loved the arms and, you know, who doesn't want big freaking arms, you know, over 20 inches, 22 inches, you know. So it was exciting in both eras, but I think, yeah, I think The Rock has them. So there you have this episode, about 40, 40 plus minutes. We still have plenty more questions. So what are we going to do? Uh, we'll skim through some of the best questions. We'll send them to Dave and we'll have some individualized answers to some of the questions. Again, we appreciate all of you that you know week in and week out participate ask your questions um be it whatever for be it on instagram when we do this show live you know on the youtube channel on the youtube live comments um and obviously we do the live uh, heavy muscle radio sunday nights uh dave chris cito at time john romano lee priest so again we appreciate all of your uh input be it live or be it in advance of a show but as always we appreciate all the support that you give us throughout the throughout the course of the calendar year um, again, if you haven't already done so, subscribe below, hit the notification bell so that when we do these live segments, you're not going to miss out. You're going to be the first to know. Um, and anything goes up, you'll get the notification on your mobile phone or wherever it is that you check your notifications. For, for Dave Paloma and Tyler Shore, I'm Sadiq Faruqi. We'll see you next week.